Good evening and thank you very much for coming. I know that Marty and Don put a lot of work into these events and we certainly appreciate that. After I so, saw all these disclaimers, I'm also excited to know that it's like the Wild West. I can say whatever I want and I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> so that'll work out well for me. Just waiting for the slides to come up. This project here, we started, uh, just give you a little bit of background, about a year ago, about t actually about 10 months ago, and it was a much larger project than we originally anticipated. But as I'll show you as we go through this, a lot of the budget overruns and improvements that we made, we'll find out when we sell the property. It's still for sale, but we hope it's gonna pay off. The address, I didn't put that uh, in the slide deck, but it's uh, 6, 3640 Ridge Pike in Collegeville. And if you're interested in seeing the final product, we have an open house this weekend. You're all more than welcome to come. We usually go Saturdays and Sundays from one to three. That would give you a real good perspective of what it looks like. Don's telling me they only have about 90 minutes. So I will try to go ahead and, and do the best I can. What I want to try to do is explain the four keys of success. Kevin and I have really brought, th brought this down to four different keys. And as we go through the slides and show you the pictures, I'd rather show you pictures than just read slides to you, tell you a little story behind each one, and make it hopefully a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to show pictures to illustrate that. And then we're going to talk about the pitfalls and the specific ways that we found to increase projects. With these larger houses, we found that the way we design the house and what we have in mind for the house dread dramatically changes once we pull down the walls and start to look at the property and walk through it. A lot of these properties, at least that we purchase, we're not able to get into the properties beforehand. This particular one here, we purchased on auction.com. And we were talking about it this afternoon. I think we bid on the property between nine and 12 times. If you've used auction.com, they actually bid against you. So it makes it difficult, but we bid on that thing about nine or between nine and 12 times before we finally purchase the property. And then after we're done here, you can see the numbers and you can decide whether getting into high value houses is something that you would like to do. So our first key to success is we believe you make your money when you buy the house, not when you sell the house. You can get into a lot of trouble, obviously paying too much for the house, but as you get into a higher dollar stream, it can really hurt you a lot. I also have a note here, don't give away your dollars, and I'll show you what, what we mean by that, but as we go through these houses, we're very cognizant to not only keep the character and charm of the house, but we also try to sell and recycle anything that we can in the house to make more money towards the project. So when we started with this project, it was a 3,200 square foot home and it has a barn in the back, as you'll see. It has seven and a half from a 7.6 acres. It was six bedrooms, but as you went upstairs, two of the bedrooms were absolutely unusable. The ceiling height was probably about five and a half feet, maybe six feet and you couldn't stand on the sides. So as bedrooms or bathrooms, they wouldn't work. They had very, very narrow hallways and everything in the house was really disjointed. It only had one full bathroom and one half bathroom in the whole house. And the rear patio was about 800 square feet and it had an unfinished basement. Now that we're completed the home, when you see the pictures, it's 4,800 square feet. We completely restored the horse barn out back and that had five original stalls. And as we went through the house and started cleaning it out, we actually found the original wood for the stalls. We actually found the original gates that were out front of the property. When you see the picture of it, those front gates, we had absolutely no intention to put there. We didn't even know we had them. But again, trying to keep the character and the charm of the house, we restored all that. We ended up making it a five bedroom house and we put an office in. Uh, we enlarged the hallways and really excelled with all the floor plans. We put a mud room in. We took one of the bedrooms downstairs, converted that to a mud room, put a separate entrance in, made it three full baths, two half baths, including one in the basement, doubled the size of the rear patio. You'll find out as we go through here, good, bad, or indifferent, the sewer main went while we were doing the house. So we had to rip nine foot of dirt out, and then we had to redo the patio. We decided 
that was about a seventy or eighty thousand dollar decision to redo the whole back of the house and the patio. And then we also had no intentions on finishing the basement, but as we went through the house and learned some of the mechanics, mechanicals in the kitchen, we had to uh, replace this what they call the sill boards around the house, and it made more sense while we were doing that to finish the basement to give the whole structure extra strength and then finish the basement and you know take the value out of that. And we also added the private gated entrance. This here, just to give you an idea, this is all public record, so I don't really care if we share it with you. This is the, the basis of the HUD statement. We paid about 320 for the house, 317, and we had about $20,000 of closing costs. So we were probably 340-ish into the house. Um, we also sold a small piece of property to one of the neighbors for about $50,000. So we were into it for you know just under 300,000. But again, with these houses, you find that the amount that you have to put into it, this was a 90 year old house, it's, it's far more than you would ever expect. So you have to give yourself a lot of room. I have a picture here of some of the radiators. This is what I was talking about. As we went through the house, we took this house, it was an oil house. We got rid of the oil and there was gas that was run from the street, Pico, to the house. We converted the house to gas. By doing that, we put a two-zone HVAC system in, much better heating and cooling. But these radiators are something we were able to sell these. Now, again, depending on how patient you are, they say you can get $100, $200 a piece. The, the larger the number of fins on the radiator, the more it's worth. But even as scrap, we sold them for, I think, about 50 bucks a piece, 50 to $75 a piece. What's nice is, if you've ever replaced one of these radiators, they're heavy as hell. They're difficult to get out of the house. If you were to put them into a dumpster, we probably save two or three thousand dollars in dumpster fees. So when we're going through these kind of houses, we really try to weigh: are we better off selling something or junking it? And then the sink. I think we got about three or four hundred dollars for the sink. Again, it's just money we can put back into the project. Scrap yards. We take all the copper in the house, we take all the aluminum from the aluminum siding in the house, even if they have um, the black steel pipes, and we try to recycle as much of that as we can. I think we probably got $2,000 total. It wasn't, again, that much money, but the black pipes that you take out of these old houses for all the water for these radiators, again, it saves us two or $3,000 in dumpster fees, so it makes a big difference. When we went through the house, whenever we take houses, we always tell the owners, leave whatever you want, we'll clean it out. If there's anything worthwhile, in this case, there was a bunch of chairs and sofas and tables. We take them over to one of the local, um, what do they call this place? It's, it's kind of like a restore, but it's, um, I don't remember. Goodwill, thank you, something like that. They give you a receipt, and then we can just write that port, you know, write that portion off. But again, it saves us a lot in dumpster fees, so it really becomes worth the time. The last one is the dumpster. Now, to us, this is a money pit. This particular house, we spent over twelve thousand dollars in dumpster fees. We took not only more junk out of the house, but the bigger the house, the more you do, the dumpster fees can really, really sneak up behind you. And the other reason I wanted to put this on here is we had a problem with one particular dumpster that we learned a big lesson. Our contractors, we try to separate things. They threw a bunch of cement into one of the dumpsters. Well, it took that dumpster, and we had cement dumpsters on site. The cement dumpster, a 20-yard cement dumpster, is about $400, maybe $450 full to get rid of. They took our 30-yard dumpster and charged us $80 a ton. So we got a bill for like $2,500, $2,600 just for one dumpster. So if you can control your dumpster costs, as crazy as it sounds, at least for us and our projects, it makes a big difference. Our second key to success, we say if you fa fail to plan, plan to fail, and the plan always changes. I was talking to Don yesterday before I submitted the slides. We had a problem with the house two weeks ago where some water came in our basement, called the insurance company, figured we were okay. It wasn't a lot of damage. It, it didn't put a foot of water in the basement or wick up the walls or anything, 
but it was enough to ruin the padding and the carpet. On the insurance agent, brought the adjuster out. As usual, it's never covered. They have 10 different ways, 10 different reasons. When I was talking to Don about it, he mentioned, and if you go on the web, I'm not gonna go through them all, but there's 17 perils that you should insure against. And I gotta say, we're gonna talk to our insurance agent again. I don't know why we keep, that, we keep on having to have the conversation, but it always seems like whenever you have some sort of peril, it's not insured. So I would, I'd really suggest reviewing those 17 to make sure that you're, you're in good shape. When we originally bought the property, this is the original print of it. Whenever we buy a property, regardless if we have to or not, we always go ahead and get it surveyed. When we had this, sur this property surveyed, we actually gained about three quarters of an acre from what the records of the courthouse said, which was a good thing. Um, that's the plot right now that we have that's 7.6 acres. And then this was the original plot. And what's really important about this is if you look right here at this line, we found out that we actually owned half the neighbor's garage. <clears throat> As they were surveying, and we are trying to be very neighbor, neighbor friendly, the neighbor actually came over to us. He's like, look, let me save you some time. My garage is on your property. I've been trying to buy it for years and years and years. If we can work something out, that would be great. Gentleman's name was Roger. He was, he was, he was a, a real nice guy. So we said, absolutely, what do you want? And we ended up selling him a small piece for about $50,000. So now that he has the backyard that he wants, but more importantly, he owns his garage again. But that's some of the little things that when you, when you purchase the properties, we always look at subdivision and such, which is the next slide. We're actually offering this property two ways. We're offering it with the house, the barn, and four acres. If you see this line right here, this is a horse fence. You're allowed to have up to four horses on the property as well. We weren't sure if people would wanna have four acres or seven and a half. So we're marketing it both ways. We've already gone to the township. We've talked to the board about land development and they'll allow us to put two properties here. This piece right here we own, we've talked to this neighbor and we're gonna land swap it and put two driveways in. When you get the properties of this size and you start subdividing and go into land development, you need to be very careful because we actually started with four houses and the township threw up all over it and got all upset and told us that we can't do it. We'd have to get attorneys ad nauseum. We always start high and then, you know, settle for something else. If we would have put three properties on, or three houses in the project, the third house would have gone right here. So we made a deal with this neighbor that if he would support us for two houses, we wouldn't build the house, which would have been in his backyard. By doing it, it also makes it a minor subdivision. So all we have to do is have two driveways that come in here. We don't have to put street lights. We don't have to put curbs. We don't have to put sewers. So the expense, whether we sell it or we end up developing it later on becomes much less. So when you, when you buy properties like this that are multiple acres, you should always take a look at the subdivision. This is a picture of the house first day we saw it big pine tree in front of it. The black car here, we, when we first went to the house, we found that it was, there was people living there. Uh, we were very surprised. In the barn, there were about four people living in the barn. And when we went to the barn, they just scrapped like rats. Um, one of the, one was Arturo was I think one of the guys. There was one gentleman who actually stayed around and we talked to him and you know he decided to leave. The gentleman that was in the house, his name was Nick. And whenever you go up to the house, we're always very professional and try to talk to them and find out you know, what's gonna happen. And he said he had a lease and he was a big tough guy and you know he had some rights and stuff, but it soon came to find out that that car, that black car in front was his car, it was broken. And the bottom line was if we fixed his car and gave him a couple bucks, he'd leave. So we made him a deal. We took his car, we towed it that day to a dealership. I think we put a thousand bucks into it. And I think we gave him maybe $1,500. He actually moved two doors down to a motel. I, I don't understand it, but he's still there today. So he's just staying at a hotel. We don't really care. We just wanted him out of the house. After we went into the house, uh, Kevin and I also received a call from the old owner who lost the sale at sheriff's sale knew that auction.com sold the house, 
somehow found our name and called us and said, hey, I want to talk to you about my house. I, you have stuff. My stuff is in your house. So we had to talk to him, and we got all the stuff moved out, and we worked it out where we actually bought a lot of the lawn mowing equipment and everything else for about 1000 bucks. So it worked out for us. Trying to give you some before and after pictures. So this is what it looks like when it's all completed with the new steps and everything. That's what it looked like before we started. So there was a pretty good transformation. We like to go ahead and take twilight photos. Um, a lot of the photographers, the photographer that we used, when we talked to her about it, she said that not enough people do that. We think that it really sets the higher end houses off, but I think it would set any house off in a much better light if you get the twilight photos. So that's why we do that. This was the barn that everybody escaped out of. Um, Falling apart, obviously, in real bad shape. I, I have to give Kevin all the credit for picking out the new way the barn looks and what we did. He did a phenomenal job, but there's a before, there's an after. We put a three-car garage on front of the barn. We found all of the original equipment for the horse stalls. It's amazing when we went into the barn, again, all disjointed, they used the original horse stalls as walls for all these little rooms and caverns. So we started to tear the barn out. We found all the original horse equipment. So that's what it looked like when we first went in there. Uh, and those doors in the back were literally just two four by eight pieces of plywood kind of leaned against each other. And that's what we cleaned it up to be. So it, it again, turned out really nice. On the upstairs of the barn, we actually restored that as well, put a new roof on the barn and uh, power washed all the wood on top of the barns about 2,000 square feet that you could make a studio, a band area, make an apartment. We have electric and gas or electric and water to the barn, so it would make it pretty easy to, to fix it up. This here's a picture of the backyard. When we first started here, I'm not kidding you, I don't know if they were called uh, thistle bushes or whatever they were, but they were waist high and you couldn't get within two feet of these fences and you were all cut up. There was also poison ivy like you would not believe. One of the guys that worked for us, we had told, we, we bought the, uh, I don't know what you call them, the white zoot suits to protect you from everything. We had gloves. We really have the guys take care of themselves. And again, we had one tough guy. He came in in shorts and a, a muscle shirt. And we told him, you know, please protect yourself. And he's like, ah, I know what I'm doing. Don't, you know, you guys don't worry about it. He spent three days in the hospital. He got poison ivy really bad. We used this thing here. What was this thing called? Brush hog. Brush hog, yeah, thrasher. It took them probably a week to just mow down the thistle bushes, but these things are unbelievable for land clearing. We wanted to go ahead and have four acres of just plain field, and this thing really helped us do that. But again, landscaping on these bigger projects, uh, it's not like you're just going to go ahead and do a couple mulch beds and spend $5,000. We've got to have twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 into just landscaping, clearing trees. Uh, we cut trees for how long? Two weeks. I had a picture I was going to put in here, but I thought it would embarrass Kevin, but he was on a pile of the logs. <clears throat> and we had two or three probably 20-foot round by 8-foot high uh, mounds of chips. We also found that if you try to take logs and get rid of them, they charge you. But if you chip them down, so we rented a chipper for a week, if you chip them down, they're, we used a place called Soil Rich, they take it for nothing. So again, it's just another way to, to cut those costs down. We also found out that we probably, I think it was eight or 10 trucks, and these trucks are about 18 tons each of dirt we had to put in the property. Unbeknownst to us, it had a riding ring on the side and if you know anything about riding rings, they put plastic down, they put sand down, and that's it. So the horses don't hurt themselves. So we had to go ahead and bring dirt in to go to get grass to grow on top of it. Plus, we took a fair amount of dirt out of it. When we were all said and done, cleaned up pretty nice. We had the, the nice meadows, but then we had to go ahead and plant grass seed. We always do something around the house where uh, we use sod. We weren't going to sod the whole property, so we just did grass seed, but again, came out pretty nice. You can get an idea of what the back of the barn looked like from there. This was the back of the house. If you look at these fences here and you look at the stonework, 
Um, it was some sort of crazy, it almost looked like a medieval castle when you first saw it. I thought it was really cool. I wanted to keep it. Kevin hated it. Luckily for him, the sewer main went, so it all went. Also, when we bought the house, I had mentioned these two roofs here. These, the top of these room ceilings were only about five feet, and you couldn't even walk over here. So I don't know, we don't even know what it was yet. It was just literally a storage room of some sort. So again, this wasn't part of the budget per se, because when we saw pictures of the house, it appeared that some of them were big enough for bedrooms in the pictures. So we decided to go ahead and raise the whole house and the whole back there, added square foot, <clears throat> and it made both of those rooms usable. This side over here, you'll see we made a complete master suite, and this over here we turned into a bedroom, and we also put a bathroom, a full bathroom behind it. But again, there are the, the unexpected expenses that if you're going to put the extra ten, twenty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars into the house, you just have to not only be aware of it and be careful you can get the money back out of it, but you have to have the stomach for it. When you're working on these type of houses, your budget overruns, I always kid Kevin that they always seem to be $10,000. They're never less than $10,000. This is just part of the, you can see the back, we had to, we ripped it out and we started to do it. That's what the back of the house turned out to be before we put the patio in. So you can see the second level, uh, he picked a gray to match the stone of the house. The stone of the house is absolutely beautiful. It's 100-year-old quarry stone. Uh, their walls are actually 18 inches thick. They had to buy some special drill bits to go ahead and get through the, the stone at some point. And this is a finished version of the back of the house with the patio and everything. We had to put this uh, retaining wall in. Township came over. We were originally going to take this dirt and just lay it down. One of our inspections, the township came over and said, since it was more than two feet high, they wanted us to put a retaining wall in. So it kind of screwed up the whole design. We had to go back to the drawing board. And that's when we came out with the porch that would have the, the whole ring around it. Originally, it was just supposed to be a flat porch. Again, all those paver bricks. And then we ended up putting the columns in. We put lights in, you know, again, added expense. But I'll, I'll say it now, but I'll say it again in the slide. You can be frugal with these projects, but you can't be cheap. We had a, the project before this we did, we did a project down in um, on Montgomery Avenue. And ironically, we bought the house behind the one we were working on. We had a partnership with somebody. We found out after we cleared the whole lot and got into the project that the partner we were dealing with didn't have the authority to make the deal. Yeah, Kevin was working there one day and some guy drove on a car and he's like, what the hell are you doing to my house? Kevin explained to him, you know, we have an agreement and here it's signed. And he's like, that's great. That's my partner. He doesn't have the authority to do that. Well, we went through and said we, he had the authority. He told us he did. Well, that's great. But legally, it didn't work. We ended up walking from that house. We lost about $20,000. We told him, we said, look, just give us what we have into it. We'll be happy. He didn't have to. He said, no. We said, fine. Ended up buying the house behind it. We bought the house behind it at auction for about $200,000 less than we had into this house. <clears throat> and we had told him what we were gonna do the house. It's fine, he took our ideas and he went one way with it, but he bought everything at Home Depot. So he's got, it was a 1.2, his house? Right. So he's trying to sell this house for one, two, we had the house behind it, and I think we were asking right around the same price. When they toured his house, they literally found Home Depot cabinetry, Home Depot faucets, and to this day, he still hasn't sold the house. And that was one of the fights that we were having with him when we were talking about the partnership. He was supposed to carry the house. We'd put all the money into it, split the profits type thing, but he didn't like the fixtures and the finishes that we picked because he thought they were too expensive, so you gotta be careful there. I was talking about this, be open to massive budget changes. Frugal is okay, but cheap is not. Picture the, the driveway here. Now, this particular driveway is a long driveway, comes from the lake, goes all the way up. It wraps around the house, goes to the garage. And when we refinished the garage, we put the three-car garage in front of it. We actually added an extra bay 
So we added an extra, I guess, 20 feet of driveway. And when we were talking about it, some of the people who came in to give us quotes, you can see that the driveway is broken up a little bit. A couple of the guys just wanted to patch it and then they were gonna you know, paint the black stuff over it and make it all one color. Again, we look at that and that's the first thing they're gonna see when they see the house. Although it hurt the, the budget and the pocketbook a little bit, we decided and we repaved the whole driveway and we paved the new section. So now when you go there, it looks, you know, brand new. And it really gives that first appeal when you, when you drive up to the house. This picture is what it used to look like, that patio, the medieval patio I talked to you about. And it had this uh, flagstone in there. So all that had to get ripped out as well. But again, that was one of those, originally we were gonna pull the flagstone out and we were gonna reuse it. And then after some discussion and thought, we decided to go with a different type of surface. This is the uh, $80,000 pipe that wasn't completely broke. Talked to the plumber, probably could have just cut that little section out or maybe we could have sleeved it or something else. We don't, we decided we don't do things that way. We'd rather do it right or not at all. So we cut it off at the house, ended up putting a half bathroom in the basement because of it. That's actually, I guess, where we found is we put the half basement in or half bathroom in and had to replace the pipe from there all the way out to where the main was. They had a new main brought into the driveway, had to replace the whole sewer name. But that was a nine foot hole we had to dig and then we had to re fill it back in, re-rock it, and then we had to do that whole patio, which is when we decided might as well put a bigger patio in. And there's the carnage of the ditch. Just picture the back of the property after we finally got it all done and settled and you have to be careful there as well. You can't rush these projects. You have to, once you disturb that much dirt, you have to let it sit there for a couple of weeks and settle. You can still tamp it in, but even after you tamp it, if you don't let it settle, bring the cement in, you're gonna have problems with the settling. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but in this particular project, we used some of our own money. We used the funding for flippers with Don and Marty. We used Rich and his wife. So we've got a, a couple of different partners in the property. And when you're borrowing a couple hundred thousand dollars at you know, hard money rates, letting something sit for a month, you know, there's a, uh, there's a cost for that. So you just have to be aware of that. But if you don't do it right, you're gonna end up going back later on, it's gonna cost you twice as much money. When it was all said and done, that's what the patio turned out to be. We picked stamped concrete, um, something we tried that was new. I don't think we'll ever do it again. Wasn't the worst thing in the world, but um, by the time you put all the money into the stamped concrete, you can almost do pavers. And looking at the two, you know, it's an opinion, but pavers would probably look better than stamped concrete. But we put, we were trying to match not only the front of the house or the back of the house, but the front of the house. And the way the pattern was out front, stamped concrete ended up being the best way to go. This is one of the better pictures of what the house looked like when we found it. This was a section of the basement that we ended up redoing. And like, like I said, you'll see here in the pictures, this was the nicer section. What's also important here is if you see these pillars and these pillars, they're literally 12 inch thick pieces of wood. It's the old wood that has the hand hewing. And we had to replace all that. You'll see two of those with steel because we put the third level on the house and because we had some issues up um, with the kitchen floor. But when we were all, f all finished, ended up studying the sides, we came out four inches, and the finished, pro the finished product turned into that. So it, it, again, really worth the effort and the time. In this particular situation, it was probably less expensive for us to finish the basement than it would have been to replace all the sills. We brought engineers and stuff in, they blessed it all and stamped it so there was no problems, but again, more value for the house for what we're doing here. These are some of the steel beams. We had to bring the engineers in. They had to dig the pits, fill it full of cement, and then put the steel beams up. The other problem we found was when you were walking through the basement, they were about, I guess, six foot, five and a half feet. So if we didn't use the steel beams, the steel beams was, a, was effectively giving us an extra eight inches of space. So it then made the other half of the basement completely usable. And it gave us the, the strength we needed for the third floor. That's what the other side of the basement came out. Those are those steel beams you saw. 
This place had two fireplaces, has, oh, sorry, has one in the basement and has one on the second floor. So whenever we can, we keep the original fireplaces. We do get them inspected and we had them rebuilt. Uh, so they're perfectly usable. Just staircase for the basement. And that's the other side of the basement. Uh, if you look at these windows here too, these are probably about a foot and a half, maybe two feet deep. So very deep window sills, and we were very careful if you decide to visit the house when you walk in the basement, it does not feel like a basement. It has plenty of natural sunlight coming in, and it actually feels like another room in the house. And this particular basement also has a walkout. We were telling you about the uh, oil-fired heater, and that side of the basement that was all in rough shape had hot water heaters. We don't use hot water heaters in our house. We use Insta-Hots, so we put an Insta-Hot for the first floor, Insta-Hot for the second floor, and then ripped all this out. And we were all said and done, that was the finished product. So even the basements we clean up, make everything crisp and clean, seal the floors, dry lock the walls just with white, so when people come in it looks really fresh. This was our, they call, we call it the bonus room, but when we first went in the house we thought we had dead bodies in this, in this room. It was bad. <clears throat> uh, we ended up having to repour some of the floors, fix up the walls. We we're all said and done. That's what it turned out to be. Now it could be a wine cellar or something else. This was what the roofs and those rooms originally looked like before we raised the roof. So you can see they're very narrow. And at the edges here, there'd be no way to stand up. We converted those into a master bath on one side. And I have to give Marty a lot of credit here. Again, this is one of those situations where we had a plan, it was all blueprinted out, we were ready to go. Um, we always invite the investors, anybody who wants to come over and look at the house, if they wanna give us an opinion, we're completely open to it. At the end of the day, we do what we want, but in this particular situation, we actually had two sinks on one side and a shower. After talking to Marty and Don, Marty suggested that we open it up and put a real big, a nice shower in, put one on each side. So on the fly, we, des we redesigned the bathroom. And then she came up with the idea that we should have vaulted ceilings. So if you look at this here, half the bathroom has a vaulted ceiling. The contractor absolutely wanted to kill us. But on the fly, made the change. And if you were to see the room, um, it was definitely worth it afterwards. This is the opposite, opposite side of the room. Put a nice soaking tub in there and we put a textured wall with tile on the back. Our belief is that, just like everybody else says, bathrooms and kitchens really sell a house. Everybody who comes into this house loves the, the kitchen. It's got a chef's kitchen and loves the master bathroom. The other bathrooms, we still use the all glass shower, so all the showers in the house look really nice. This here you can see this is how wide, which it looks a lot bigger in the picture, that was only about three feet. When we first got to the house, one of the problems we had was you went upstairs and the staircase from the, from the, the one bedroom, when you walked out the bedroom and you went to go on the staircase, you would literally fall down the steps. So when we added onto the house, we added another seven feet. So the up, upstairs hallway is very spacious. And again, makes a big difference, grand entrance into the master bedroom suite. Found a house, this is just to give you an idea, the other side, you can see before we ripped it down, how narrow these ceiling levels were. And they just, you know, obviously left debris and trash everywhere. This is the master bedroom. I'm sorry, this is not the master bedroom. This is the, the bedroom I just showed you after we knocked it out and raised the roof. We didn't vault those ceilings, but uh, we made them eight and a half feet. Fourth key to success, look for hidden opportunities to enhance the value and seize them. This is very difficult um, because when we say see the opportunities and seize them, that always comes with a big dollar sign at the end of it. You really have to be able to look at the house and decide if you're going to invest another X amount of dollars, what's my return on investment going to be? This particular structure here was the bane of our existence. These are the pillars that originally were at the front, of the, uh, the front of the house when you come in the driveway. We were gonna put pavers here. This was stone. At the end, for budget reasons, we decided to make it 
uh, McAdam. And it was partly for budget, but it was more for when we talked to the township, they said the snow plows would come by and completely rip our cobblestone driveway up. So it would be a waste of our time. <clears throat> but these pillars here, we had to rebuild, I'm embarrassed to say it, but three times. So we got a mason out there and uh, he did a horrible job the first time. He said he knew how, knew how to point bricks and do this and do that. And I'm not kidding you, when you looked at the two statues, unless you were flat drunk, they one listed left, one listed right, they were kind of S's. They were the ugliest pieces you've ever seen. So the second time we built it, I'm gonna go to here, we had other contractors and they knew what they were doing, everything was gonna be great. They built it and it actually turned out pretty well. Went for our final inspection, and, th and this is just one of the, the pitfalls and perils that happens where we had to run power. This is the front of the house, that's the driveway. Since we put automatic gates in and we decided to put electric down there, we had to dig a pit. We had a big fight with the building inspector because it was low voltage wiring go out there, going out there. He still made us dig a pit three foot deep and put it in conduit. So we ran extra wires down there and naturally it was only a day project. We just didn't, you know, we're real smart guys, but we don't know what the weather's gonna do. That pit filled in five minutes. It took us hours to pump the water out. So we get back and we build, build it the second time when we're getting our final inspection. Now we had everything blueprinted, pulled our permits, went to the township, the whole nine yards. Township, our inspector comes out and he happened to be driving with the township manager that day. And he came to the property and the, the building inspector walked around, he saw what we did, you guys do great work, we love it, good to go. Township manager said, hold on, what about the easement? We both looked at the township manager, like, what the hell, what do you mean easement? Well, you're on Ridge Pike, okay? Like, they're exactly where they were. We had a whole discussion about grandfathering, didn't wanna to have to, to rechange everything and do everything. You took our sealed prints and you told us we were good to go. This is the second time, and they knew the peril that we did. Township manager makes a phone call, he comes out and he says, you're seven feet too close to the road. What are we going to do? He said, you got to move them. So again, ripped them down. And then we had to rebuild them a third time. Kevin ended up doing it the third time because we were so sick and tired of everybody else screwing it up. We did it ourselves. Weren't happy about it, but the township made us move it seven feet further down the driveway. So even when you do things right, and we talked to the township about who's going to pay for it, and they laughed. They said, you are. So... Live and learn. But that's that was the final product. We found those gates, and this whole thing started, there was only two pillars there when we bought the house. We had no intention of doing any of this. But when we looked at it, we found the original gates buried under the horse barn. So when they were cleaning out the horse barn, we found the gates, and we thought it would be cool to have a gated entrance. And after we talked about that, we said if we make a motorized to put a code there, you know, we can say it's a gentleman's estate or it's an estate type property. Uh, that's how we got there. Front of the house, <clears throat> we had another interesting situation. When we bought the house, these steps looked pretty good. Looked like maybe we just have to coat them or take them off and redo them a little bit. As we got into the project, and there's no way anybody would have known this until you started to do it, we started to take the steps away and it was kind of like a house of cards, and there was nothing holding the staircase together. So as we looked at it, and we started to dig, dig down, we found out that the culprit of this whole thing, and we had to dig down six, four feet. We had, to, we had to dig down an extra four or five feet below the driveway level, and what we found was when they built this house, they used to burn coal, and they used coal cinders as the substrate for the steps and they had several feet of it. I guess it worked for 70 years, just so we got lucky, it didn't work for us. So we had to rip it all out and you know, we tried to decide what to do. We ended up putting uh, flagstone tops and we built the, built the steps out of um, like E.P. Henry blocks. Again, at the end of the day, it was the main entrance to the house. So we really wanted to make sure that it looked nice 
had no idea what that expense was going to be. Uh, we looked at bringing prefab staircases in and a couple other ways to do it. But uh, you'll see around the top here, we used the original wrought iron railings. The township made us put doilies at the top of it to bring it back up to code for, I think it was 30 inches or 36 inches. But we wanted to use those, so the only way that would work is, you know, with this motif here, and that's how it, and that's how it turned out at the end. So we, again, we were very happy with the product. It looks great, but just unexpected. And this word unexpected, at least with us, maybe we're doing something wrong, but with these larger houses, there's a lot of unexpected. This is another one, and this is something interesting. It's more of a pitfall you want to be careful of. Working on the house, lost part of the lights in the house, talked to the contractor. It's never the contractor's fault. He always points the, the finger to somebody else. But what we found out was one of the legs was bad in the house. We called Pico. Pico came out, said, absolutely good news. We're shutting your house down. It's not safe. What about fixing it? And they said, in these type situations, when you have properties and we have telephone poles on our property, Pico is only responsible to the first telephone pole on the property. You have to pay, and you, won't, you can't pay Pico, you have to pay somebody else to run the line from the house to the first pole, let it sit there, and then they will go ahead and hook it up. We were able to work out a, a pretty good deal with Pico, and um, we remunerated the gentleman sufficiently enough that we got to pull the cable and we were actually only down for about an hour. Originally, they told us it was gonna be two weeks. So again, if you have power coming in over off of poles, that's something that if you can check it, get it checked beforehand, it'll save you a lot of money. And that was just these guys with their, their big bucket trucks. They originally wanted to go across the lawn to do this. And again, fortunately, we were on the property that day. If they would have gone on the lawn, we would have had another bill for pulling them out of the lawn. It has rained so much in the last year, the lawn was soft enough that their trucks would have just sank in the lawn. This here is um, the mudroom. Bought the house, we, uh, we used decorators and consultants and such. Our decorator came up with this idea and it ended up being absolutely phenomenal. What we ended up doing was since we had raised the roof on the house and essentially added two more bedrooms, this used to be a bedroom on the first floor. So we gutted it and we made it a mud room and we also put a separate entrance in. So now when you come off the back of the house, you have a, a side entrance to the kitchen and a side entrance to the mud room. Flow of the house, it really complemented it well. Uh, we were talking about, or I was talking about trying to keep the original character. If you look up here, there's this beautiful piece of marble that says, keep keep the home fires burning. And it's really a beautiful piece. It's right over the mantle. We were able to clean it up and restore it and, and keep it with the fireplace. It's the little touches like this that at least in these larger houses, we found that when buyers come in that like to have the old woodwork, we were able to resurrect to refinish all of the hardwood floors in the house, except for the kitchen, the hallway upstairs and one bedroom. All the other floors we were able to restore and they look absolutely beautiful. If you, if you look at hardwood floors or as you start to look at them, you'll notice that today's hardwood floors will not look like a 100-year-old floor. And a 100-year-old floor, they call it zebraing. You see a lot of the really thick black marks that were the knots in the trees or the green. You can't get that in today's hard floors. And the people who buy, at least in our case, these type of houses, they're looking for a modern house feel with an old house character, and that allows you to do that. Those are the floors I was talking about. Um, this is just an after picture of the living room where the fireplace is. <clears throat> we also took one of the bedrooms, and this, this is here for two reasons. We decided to take one of the bedrooms, when it, we ended up with a six bedroom house and figured, who's gonna have six kids? Who's gonna need six bedrooms? You need six kids? Do you really? And they all have their own bedroom? Well, God bless you. See that? <laughs> that works out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we decided to take one of the bedrooms and make it an office. And the reason I did, the reason I put this slide up here is we talked to 
other flippers and investors, and it seems to be right down the center, half of them do not stage their houses and half of them do. I'm, I'm here to tell you, at least for us, staging the house makes a huge difference. You take a bedroom like this and you make it an office, now when your buyers walk in, they understand what you're trying to do. This is the other side of the office. Or they walk into a room like this. We've got, a, we've got many rooms in the house that are just plain floors, but when buyers walk in and they see something like this versus something like this, it's a huge difference. So it's definitely worth in your budget putting money in for staging. That's just the other side of that room. These hallways, um, when we first started, they were two foot hallways. We literally cut the big arches out and I think we made them five feet, five and a half feet. Try to give an open look to the house. Nothing different than you would do with other houses, but we have four or five arches we have to do that with versus one. So it's just a lot more expense. I'm not gonna show you all the bathrooms, just wanted to give you an idea of what the bathrooms look like. We redid all the bathrooms in the house, obviously, and we added several. Dining room, we put all that in. We put new uh, windows in the house. Kitchen-wise, our kitchen was an absolute mess, and they had the stacks from the old heating systems and water systems coming up the sides of the windows. So we ended up completely gutting the whole kitchen, gutting the floor and, and rebuilding it from scratch to a rectangle, something that we could work with. And then we put a nice size kitchen in with an island, the chef stove, and we put the, uh, the hood in, built in microwave. We went with uh, monogram appliances in this one, and we've been back and forth. The house we did before this, we used Viking appliances. We had a lot of problems with Viking, and we went to the appliance store and talked to the salespeople. They actually told us that Viking's quality has diminished greatly over the past couple of years, and they suggested either monogram or wolf, and they geared us towards, they steered us towards monogram because we wanted a matched appliance in the house. If you go with Wolf, you can't have matched appliances. You have to have sub-zero refrigerator, which isn't necessarily bad, but then you have to have a different kind of dishwasher. They don't make dishwashers, and you can have the Wolf stove. So we decided to go with matched appliances. And I think it turned out very nice overall. Just some more pictures. We put a little Eden in the kitchen as well. That's that hallway upstairs that we enlarged. We ended up putting the wood diagonally down that hallway just to have it offset for the rest of the bedrooms. With each bedroom, like I was saying before, we always try to keep the character. All the built-ins, a little up there, and they had vaulted ceilings and they have nice beams coming by. So whenever we can, we always keep that character. It's very important. This is the master bathroom. Just give you an idea of the showers. We always try to put an upgraded shower in. We put the shower head, we put the wand, we put the seat, and then we have the three zone controls. So it's never a problem. And there's the other side of the bathroom. Just the front of the house after it was finished again with lighting. These are just a, a couple of after pictures. Um, and we struggle when we, we have not sold the house yet. So that's going to be the last the last chapter of the story. That's the backyard. Um, came out really nice. We do like the twilight photos. We use those. That's the back of the house at night and the gates. Here's what we strive for. So you get familiar with these projects, get experience. We're somewhere in between the get experience. We have plenty of experience. We definitely haven't achieved mastery yet. I think we've got two or three more houses, but uh, we've learned quite a bit. And in the million dollar realm, you definitely want to make sure that you achieve that mastery, otherwise you're going to lose your, your rear. This is something Kevin and I talk about a lot. And we say that flipping million dollar houses is not for the faint of heart. So definition wise, it's lacking the courage to face something difficult or dangerous, to be faint of heart, to be hesitant or nervous. If you are a hesitant, if you are a nervous person, flip five $200,000 houses rather than one million dollar house. A million dollar house is, it's kind of like having kids though. When you have one kid, it's so much. The second kid isn't twice as much work. It's like three times as much work. Million dollar houses are the same way. If you flip five $200,000 houses, it will be less work, but there's more potential here. And just for kicks, I also looked up, I wasn't sure 
how to properly do faint of heart. I wasn't sure if it was F-E-I-N-T or F-A-I-N-T. Ironically, the definition, the other faint, is a deceptive move intended to look like an attack, which is made to distract an adversary's attention from, from the real attack, which is coming from another direction. I call that your contractor. <laughs> so to me, it should be F-E-I-N-T of heart. So again, we say the million dollar houses, if you're gonna get into this, it's not for the faint of heart. Tried to make it as quick as possible, Don. 100 slides, and I don't know how long, but any questions? Go ahead. When did you first purchase the house? What was the time of the year? Repeat, repeat the question, because you didn't use the mic. But go ahead. Have to use the mic. <clears throat> Are we going to bring him up on camera, too? When did, you, when did you purchase the house? I think it was June of last year. June of last year, and then permits in that township took us we we tried to fast track it took us about a month so we really didn't get to work on the house until july yes no um same contractors we actually house before we upgraded to a new contractor he did very well uh, the only problem we had for him and we worked it out with him. He bid on the project, his problem, but it becomes our problem, he underbid. Now because of that, we worked with him and I'm gonna say we were able to receive more work for a better rate, but at the end of the day, it was, it was more dollars. No, seriously, the Masons were a disaster. We had gentlemen who, he, was a, he said he was a Union Mason. It was the worst masonry job. When he, when he paid, this gets bad. When we poured the patio the first time, it was so bad. When we got there, I actually called Kevin to look at the job, and I said, rip it out. And they were trying to talk us out of it, and we got Jack, rip, I don't know what you don't understand, rip it out. And they had to do it a second time. Um, electrician, we burned an electrician, not because he didn't do good work. We gave him half his money and he just never showed up. I'm sure it's never happened to anybody else, but. Was that patio story the one with the, you, you rolled a marble and it didn't, it rolled in the wrong direction Yeah, we, <clears throat> Yeah, we have a thing that and it, it comes from the house before. I don't know what it is with us in masonry, but the house that we did on the main line before, we had a patio problem as well and we weren't sure what to do, so we decided to rip it out and do it. And when they were putting the molds in, Kevin and I were there and we looked at it and we said, that's pitched the wrong way. No, 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 you don't know what you're talking about, we're good. And I said, if it's wrong, you're gonna rip it out. We don't know what we do, we're the dumbest guys in the world and we're fine with that. So they, they poured all the, all the patio and I have the marble test. And I bring a marble out and I just put it in the patio. When it rolls towards the house, rip it out. Marbles don't lie. So that's what we use to check our work. Any other questions? Go ahead, use the mic, please. Um, certainly. Uh, actually, it was kind of two questions. Sure. One, for a house and a project like this, I would think you would find up front a really seasoned, good real estate agent that you would use for selling the house and then use them as a consultant as to what sells. Um, you know, we're gonna do this, that, and bounce that off of them. And they, of course, would have an interest because it would sell quicker for a higher level. And then, so I, I hadn't heard any mention of that, and I was wondering if that had occurred. And the second thing, looking at the basement where you had the kind of new trusts in there, uh, if you spray it a light gray, it blends in, and it doesn't look like the wood or any ducting up there. It's been, you okay. know, I, saw I see what you're saying. some houses, it's, quote, a New York industrial look, mm -hmm. but I also saw it, uh, Columbus, Ohio has some, I'm from there, they have some pretty impressive trade of homes, and they had somebody who did that for the basement, and it's like, for a gallon or two of paint, it takes it away from, they didn't finish it here, we need to put something up to, oh, wow, uh, I get, uh, ceiling's invisible, you know, type thing, so well, they don't even think of it. 
I'll take the second one first. I appreciate that, and we will try that in one of our houses. That's a great idea. I know exactly what you're talking about. Same, similar to here, it just makes it blend in. <clears throat> sure. Absolutely. That's a great idea. And the first one, I'm going to be on the hot seat. I am the realtor. Obviously, I'm not doing a good job. The house isn't sold. If you guys know anybody looking to buy a house in Collegeville, we're listing the house with four acres for 1.35. And then there's three and a half acres back in the back of it. That's another 300,000. And you can either buy it together or you can buy it separately and subcontract or uh, subdivide. Hard to find places for horses out there. If it is, go to the horsey set. Go to where? The horsey set, the people that are in the horses. We've actually, in the last two weeks, contacted a couple of realtors that specialize in that. The problem that we had was um, there's not a lot of agents, or I shouldn't say that, we have not found enough agents familiar with selling the million dollar plus homes that can help us. We've had two brokers opens. Everybody who comes through the house tells us how, how nice it is, how great it is. We ask them about price. We get some opinions that it's priced too low. We've gotten a few that it was priced too high. We started at one five, I think it was, and we've brought it down, but we've been unable to sell it. And we're not sure if it's price. I mean, all things being equal, it would be price. Where's your break even? Our break even's probably about one, 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 two. And what were you asking? One three for the house, one three five for the house, one six five with the seven and a half acres. Raise that about three or four hundred thousand. Take your minimum as what they need to finance and write the note for the rest. And Say that again. Write a note for the rest that you carry. So you're out of it. You've got a note they're paying on. They're either cash <clears throat> or it's a second mortgage, and you can always foreclose from the second mortgage. So. You raise the money some, but you give them really good terms on the second. I would have no problem with that. In general, our experience has been once you find the person that wants to buy the million dollar plus house, exactly, it's not a money. We've had two people that wanted to buy the house cash. We didn't dissuade them. One of them had horses. Over the weekend, they, they actually had, I think it was three horses or four horses. They were told by the township they could only have two. We went back to the township, work with the township, work with the solicitor. We have our property only in the township. You can have four horses. By the time we got back to that buyer, which was, I don't know, a week and a half, they said, we decided we're just cashing it all in, selling everything, we're moving down south. So you never know. Love to try it, but we've just, we've generally found that People can afford houses like that. You're on the market longer, but it's not a money problem. Any other? Yeah, it's a unique property. You need a unique buyer. <clears throat> Go ahead. Your question, please. Can you explain a little bit of in depth about the difference between finding contractors for the mid-level and contractors for the high end? You want to take that or you want me to do it? I would say difference in contractors, it, it, at least for us, it's going to come down to a trust. When you talk to a contractor, I would not personally use a contractor that has it. It's going to be, it's going to be a catch-22. If you have a contractor that's never done a high-end house, I wouldn't let them touch the house. If you have contractors who have done high-end work, mid-level work, I would go with that. If you have a contractor that's doing your mid-level work and they'll work with you and let you explain to them and let your designer explain to them what it means to have a higher-end house and they'll accept it, I would work with that contractor. We've had contractors that are reasonable and want to work with you and listen. We've had many contractors who, like I said, you can, if you, if you know something is wrong, like when I was talking about the masonry, and you tell them about it, they'll spend two hours telling you how wrong you are, rather than spending five minutes and getting a level and saying, 
you know what? I was turned around the wrong, wrong way, whatever the excuse is. So it's, it's more of a, a trusted experience thing. Any other questions? Hi. I have a question about Nick, the guy that you had to toss out of the, of the house. Our friend Nick, yeah. Yeah, was he a tenant or a squatter? What was the situation there? And what rights does he have that you had to pay him off? I don't understand that. All right. Um, was he a squatter? I'm going to have to say yes, but no. And the reason I have to say both is he said he had a lease. And originally there was like four guys living in there. When we actually got into the house and started looking at it, the water was well water. It had the filter and what's it called, the UV? The UV system had not been changed in years. And he was, sorry to laugh, he was complaining about getting sick. Well, my God, there was more bacteria in that water than probably in the sewer plant. But <clears throat> he also told us he had a lease. Next week I'll get it for you, you know? So we went back, he didn't, and we found out that the owner was in foreclosure trying to rent his house out to four guys at 800 or six, six or 800 a month. Whatever they were paying, he was just pocketing that money and not paying the rent, which put the house in foreclosure. Brilliant idea, it just didn't work very long. So with Nick, what we also look at is, I'm gonna say fortunately, he didn't know all of his rights, but it's not my job to explain it to him. We always found that if we're gonna extricate somebody, it's gonna cost us at least $10,000 and probably 90 days. It's easier to start low and throw a couple bucks out of them because generally they don't wanna be there anyway. They're embarrassed. They just wanna, they need enough, and they don't, it's ironic, they don't think more than 30 or 60 days ahead. If you can get me into an apartment or a house for 30 days, I'm good. We, Kevin and I talk about it all the time. What happens when six, if you can't afford this, we'll get you wherever you want. And if you get them off the property for 30 days, all the, all the legal problems go away okay. because they left. So it's, it's more of a path of least resistance. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So you walked us through this whole process. Lessons learned. What would you... That's question one. Question two, walk us through the uh, auction.com process. We've had auction.com as a speaker here. Right. And I'd like to compare what they told us to your actual experience. But lessons learned first. I would say, the, at least for me, I'll have Kevin answer for himself, but the biggest lesson I've learned is it's still going to come to that magic number that you can sell the house for versus what you put into it. Because when you get into a house like this, you have to remember, at least the houses we work on, this thing's almost 90 years old. Nothing's been done to it. When you walk into the house, you wouldn't let your dog live in the house. It's where do you stop and where do you begin? And for some of the things that we did in the house, like if we wouldn't have raised the back of the house and made that hallway larger, I honestly don't believe we ever would have sold the house, period. But by doing that, it was an extra you know, X amount of dollars. And uh, I think that would be my biggest lesson. I don't regret anything we did. I don't think anything we did was wrong, but time and price will tell. If we get what we're asking for the house, we're in good shape. If we have to bring it down to a million dollars, probably still gonna be okay, but then you did a lot of work for nothing. And I would say the second lesson, if there was two lessons, I don't know how to fix it yet, but the contractors, and that was what that gentleman asked, certain things that you do, electric's not that big of a deal. You can't really screw electric up that bad. But when you go and you bring a cement truck up and he pours $6,000 of the concrete in two hours and it's wrong, it's a problem. So I would vet, to your point, those contractors a lot better. <sighs> Um, I would, my biggest one is don't, don't do stamped concrete. <laughs> it's, uh, it, some people like it more than EP Henry pavers or things like that. But, uh, me personally, I just, I, I think it looks a lot nicer. And like Trevor said, our masonry was a big problem on this project. Kind of 
got us over our, our number that we wanted to be at. Um, so like he said, that's, you know, what, where I came in and I actually did probably, I probably saved this good $7,500 by doing some of the masonry myself. I mean, I'm not, I've never, I've, I've worked for a mason for before, but, uh, I guess the biggest lesson here is just, just hire the right guys. And, you know, you gotta have the, you gotta be able to trust your contractors and, and I think we have a good group. We just, uh, there's just a few that we definitely won't use again. Um, but we got, we, we met a bunch of good ones this, this project and uh, we'll definitely use them again. So. Somebody said earlier, if you get good contractors, they knew good contractors. I believe that to be true. And I'll say this, this part of the masonry that we did at the end, um, I was real adamant about like after after they screwed it up so many times. Again, we weren't happy that we had to do it, but I personally felt that if we didn't do it, it wasn't going to get done right. It was it was that bad. And again, with concrete, if you screw up concrete, it's not just the fact that they poured it wrong. Now you've got two hundred or two thousand square feet. You have to jackhammer out. It takes a couple days. You've got to get dumpsters back in it, you know, a couple hundred or a couple thousand per dumpster. It puts you way behind. On this particular project, we were also starting to run near the end of the summer. There's not that many good days to pour. There were, there were more bad days to pour than good days. So. Oh, auction.com. Auction.com, right. Auction.com. Um, I have a lot of bad things to say about them, but I, I got to tell you a lot of good things too, because the two best houses we've bought, we bought on auction.com. So if you go through the process, it's okay. My big problems with auction.com is they tell you, okay, in fact, we're bidding on two or three houses right now. We've bid on those houses twice, I think, or three times, but we were talking about it this afternoon. They've been on auction nine times. So auction.com is not your typical auction where, you know, you bring X amount of dollars and the high bidder wins. What they'll do is they say, okay, this property is going to start at $63,000. It's worth $350,000. And your bid increments are $25,000. Now, as the price goes up, your, big, your bid increments go down. My other problem is you bid that opening bid at $100,000 auction.com bids against you and goes 125 and we didn't realize that till we started looking at the numbers and they're allowed to bid at whatever they want they don't have to bid by the increments so you may bid 125 it goes down to ten thousand dollars and they bid 130 and you're looking at it like why well, would it bid 130 but now you have to bid ten thousand above that so you gotta go to 140 and each time we've won the house on auction.com, we've never won the auction. They call us a day or two later and they say, hey, you were pretty close to our reserve price. If we, can, if we can work it out a little bit, we can get it to you. Okay, we work it out, you come to a figure, boom. Immediately when you're done the conversation, you have to send, you have to send what is it, five or 10%, whatever the number is. So. You know, got to do it right away, 24 hours, or you're going to lose the, lose the auction, and you have to settle in five days. That's what we want to hear. Great, let's get the project going. You wire them the 10%. I think it took 45 days on the... It's ridiculous. Then they, then they call you back and they say, oh, sorry, you don't have clear title, or oh, we don't have this, or oh, we don't have that. And then when they're ready to settle, can you settle tomorrow? And I mean, on, on one of the houses, it was so bad, I don't remember which one of us was out of town. We just said, no, forget it. We don't want the house. They're like, what do you mean? You have to take the house. No, we were ready for it. We're on vacation. I, no, either wait till next week. And they were like, well, we're not waiting. Great, refund us our money. They did refund the money and it wasn't a problem. But if you're going to use auction.com, it is a, a process. So just to give you a little insight into auction.com, because we've learned a little bit about it, if you go into their website, you'll see a lot of companies are listed as their sponsors, I guess you call it, or their, uh, their hosts or what have you. Uh, so when you bid on a property, uh, it's a blind auction to you. Yes. 
it's not a blind auction to them. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes, right? Uh, Dr. Bill knows all about it. What do you this. mean the ho their partners can see? So, yes, so what they do is you bid a number, <laughs> then, their, then their partners will, bid, especially if they own the property, they'll bid you up 25000 You'll bid up another whatever thousand. That makes sense. They'll keep bidding you up until right. you get above the... Uh, and actually, I'm the only one bidding against myself. You're bidding against yourself. They'll keep bidding you up, and you'll finally get to a point where they'll, somebody will bid, you know, one, of their, one of their sponsors will bid you higher than that, and you think you've lost the property. And they call you back. That's when they call you, and yes. they withdraw their bid, and now you win. Yes. But you're that makes sense. thousands of dollars above what you wanted to get. get well, what we've, what we've done, and we... They won't tell you that. Part. Right, wrong, or indifferent, and I, that makes sense. Right, wrong, or indifferent, we have a number going into the property, and we bid to that number. And if that number is middle between, you know, if it's one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and the next bid puts us at one hundred and thirty, we stop at one hundred and twenty, and we we just bid and bid and bid and bid. And the other the other thing I have it's a real problem with auction.com. If it was an auction, and you were going to win or lose that day, I'm in. But the problem is you've got to put $2,500 down per property just to bid. So here we are bidding on five properties. We've got $12,500 tied up for whenever the hell they, think they, they feel like giving it back. And, Bill, what was your experience about getting the money back? You had a – get to the mic there, please. Tell us the story real quick. Please. Pretty please. <laughs> Bill has some experience with this. I can't talk if it ain't on. <laughs> anyway, what happened is he, he was the high bidder on two properties, but he didn't meet the reserve. And then they sat on his upfront money for almost six months till, wow. he, till he got it back. So he had that, you know, he, he had that money tied up. And, and that's I used to bid on him. I used to bid there all the time, and I, ne and I never got nothing. I mean, and then I just started getting into it and just hearing these horror stories, like you're saying, where and so well, I like I said, with them. It, it's bittersweet for us, but we've been successful. Yeah. But I, but realizing, like I said, you bid on five properties, you have all this money tied up, and then if you don't win and you find three properties tomorrow, now you're twenty grand into it. But I've I've heard of very few people that have been successful okay. with them, you know, getting properties. So. We were successful twice. I'm sorry? Yeah, probably 12 or 15. No, we're pretty happy with it. Go ahead. Uh, every auction, you have to understand their strategy, what motivates the people running it. With auction.com, if I remember correctly, they have a period where they advertise this is coming up, then they have open houses. Uh, front run it. In other words, as soon as it comes out, take a look if you're interested in it. Don't put your highest offer in, but put a low one. Call them up. Hey, I just want to buy it flat out. Is it available? And at some point in time, you'll develop credibility and you'll find out they are, and they may just do it. So they know what it's going to sell for approximately. And even if it, it doesn't quite work a couple times, just keep being persistent. And you, you'll find, because when you go to these places and they start having the auction, it's withdrawn. It wasn't withdrawn. Somebody bought it. It's funny you say that because the first property that we bought, um, the only way we knew about it is we were working on that property. I told you we had the partnership and had to go over the fence for something and saw this. And we're like, what the hell is that? Oh, my God, they're going to have an auction, an open house. We went to the open house and it was auction.com. We actually offered them about fifty thousand dollars more at that point to buy the house than we ended up buying it for at auction. So we tried to work with them. They said no. Here's the minimum we need to have. They already had the open house. It was before the open house. Oh, okay. So yeah, we went to the open house. Um, that at, and there's also a real estate agent usually listed there. We talked to the realtor, yeah. Yeah, but before the auction, before it gets going, as soon as you can, as soon as they put it up, you know, it'll be open two weeks from now on a Saturday and Sunday, and then another two weekends after that. As soon as you see it, if you're interested, just drive on to them and be friendly, and you'll eventually uh, Fair enough. pierce <clears throat> the, the thing, and they'll just call you up. 
and okay. sell it to you. We've had no luck with those type of people. We've had no luck with banks either. We've never, we've called many, many, many banks that supposedly, in the quotes, want to sell a property, and they're so unrealistic, it's unbelievable. But that's just our experience. Are there any other questions or any questions you want to put onto Slido? We, I think you've already answered this one question about uh, Nick, whether you had to pay him off and what, what rights did he have and so on. I think you addressed that already. That was, me. That, that was you, okay. Any other questions? One thing I remember when we first started this project, we tried to figure out what the comps were. There were no comps <laughs> for this project. This, this is, again, I, <clears throat> whether you, it's worth your time to come visit the property, it really is. This is, and we just happened to pick them, a very unique property. Now, one of the reasons I'm not afraid to keep the price where it is, it's the last seven acres in Collegeville like this. Like Don said, there are no comps. It's a property that it's going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an executive, a professional that wants an older estate type house that you have no problems with. If you could find, we've talked to a couple people that are uh, landscapers or electricians. If you had a business, to the gentleman's point, like as a realtor trying to, to find the, the perfect person, if you had a business, it's zoned properly that you could actually run your business out of the barn, and the barn's 3,000 square feet between the two stories, charge yourself $10,000 in rent and cash flow the house. So there's, there's scenarios that make good sense. It's just a matter of finding that unique buyer. And on good, better, and different, our buyer pool is very narrow. Can that, can that uh, upper story be rented to a, another party? Is that zone, is it zoned for that? Or is it, is that I honestly don't occupied? know, but I think so because it's far enough away from the main structure, I don't think you'd have a problem. Because they've, they've talked about putting even automotive shop. <laughs> One guy, we wanted to make it a funeral parlor. Who would know? Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn will, will check that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Would you do another million dollar flip? Absolutely. Okay, right answer. <laughs> Absolutely, I would. I, I love that. Certainly, 3460, 3460, Ridge Pike, R I D G E, Pike, and it's in Collegeville. In your GPS, it may come up as Norristown, but it's Collegeville. Yes, and we're, if you, we don't know the area, but it's at the top of Mile Hill, whatever that, if that makes sense. Lower Providence, Lower Providence Township, yes. Who's speaking, please? I can't see you. <clears throat> oh, uh, uh, get to the mic. Uh, and Marie. the whole reason we, the gentleman was talking about a, a realtor, the old, whole reason we became, one of us became a realtor, is we couldn't find anybody to do the job that we needed to have done. Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, I just wanted to know where the property was and then just mention the area that it was in. And you were saying it was on the top of Mile Hill, and that's right. Yes. Correct. It's Lower Providence. Correct, right Lower around, Providence. It's right around near like Franco's Pizzeria, isn't it? I could tell you where the bars are. <laughs> Pizza, I don't know. I, I have an, Eagleville uh, Tavern, we have little yeah. plaques there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Thank right you. by Eagleville Tavern. Why don't we have a uh, dig uh, event in the barn? There you go. I would do we, that. We can bring everybody out there. Well, I can't do that because it's not going to be here in September. Well, well, we'll do, we'll do in August or we'll do a July meeting or something. There you go. It's uh, the hardest part. I, well, the hardest part for at least for us for these billion dollar properties. <clears throat> and when we were down, when we were on the main line, it's funny. I joined Berkshire Hathaway, and there were two women that run all the real estate in that area. And if you aren't with them, you don't sell a house. I don't get that impression in Collegeville, but when I told them I had a house in Collegeville and it was going to sell for over a million dollars, they kind of went, eh. So I changed over to Montgomeryville Keller Williams, the luxury division. Not sure what we're going to do there yet, but um, finding, the, again, for us, finding the agents who are capable of selling the million-plus home seems to be difficult. 
I've even gone onto the MLS and reverse looked up all the homes that million dollar agents have sold, called them personally, emailed them. I don't, I mean, I, I don't understand it because on this house here, you're talking about a $60,000 commission. I would think that would be enough to motivate people. Evidently it's not. to its own, you very rarely find a million dollar piece of property in that area. That's partially true. If, if you search, believe it or not, there's about four houses within a mile of ours that are anywhere from one, one, and one of them was two, 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 four. Coming towards the house, there's probably, I don't know, maybe four different properties with horse barns, and there's this one. It, it's got to be a $3 million house. It's just, it's a huge lot. Um, it's a beautiful place. Um, but yeah, on that side of Ridge Pike, I, I agree. There's there's one or two up in within a radius that are million-dollar homes, but... Right, and, yeah. and compared to the main line, like that's another thing. Like when we were, there's so many buyers down there for a million dollar homes or plus, you know. The prices have increased, and they have done a lot of building in that area, and they are increasing the homes. I there think are it's quite a few back, homes yeah. you'll find that are five, six hundred thousand dollars, but that's only in like the, maybe the past five or seven years that you're finding homes within that price in that area. Now, it's also interesting when we first put the house up for one nine with the seven acres, and we changed our strategy. Uh, we had a buyer come in, wanted to write a full price offer. And she was in, I don't know what the school district is, Spring House, Springfield, whatever the school district next to ours is. Springford. Springford. So she had a child in Springford. They had two more years to go. Mm -hmm. And we actually said, I mean, we, I think we really think outside the box. We actually said, tell you what, call the administration building. We will pay your school taxes for the next two years if you buy the house. So you're going to pay, what, the, what school district are we in? Uh, Se not Central. No, no, what school district are we in? Uh, Mithacton. So we're in Mithacton School District. Right. Um, I th yeah, I think her taxes were seven or 8000 Are The taxes on this property, which aren't that bad, are about eleven five. So... Comparatively, it's not that bad. So we told her that, and she was all excited, went to the school district, and they said, absolutely not. And we were like, you've got to be kidding me. We would have paid four years if they would have asked for it. But the school district is what killed us on that particular deal. And, the, and these people said they had been looking for a house for over a year. So it's, it's a matter of finding that right buyer. Okay, any final questions? If that's the case, let's give Trevor Thank you. Thank and you very much. A great round of applause. Thank you very much, guys.